Hello, everyone. On behalf of Crystal and my colleagues, a very warm welcome to Crystal's webinar titled Put on the Break Global Monetary Policy Developments and the Implications for India. I'm Pankhuri Tandon, economist at Crystal and your host for today's event. We are having this webinar at a time when global economy is in a state of transition from COVID-led recession towards a new normal. Just as the pandemic caused an extraordinary impact on the economy, the recovery post the pandemic has also sprung an interesting set of developments and challenges. Central banks are now at the cusp of veering themselves from the unconventional easing measures towards normalizing their monetary policies. What would that mean for the Indian economy going ahead? To answer questions around this theme, we have an eminent set of speakers to offer their insights. To begin this event, I would like to invite Mr. Amish Mehta, MD and CEO at Crystal. As MD and CEO, Amish leads Crystal's Indian and global businesses, steering its efforts to deliver high quality analytics, opinions, and solutions to corporations, investors, financial institutions, policymakers, and governments. I now request Amish to please set the context for today's discussion. Thank you, Pankhuri. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all who have joined this webinar. Growth, inflation, and monetary policy environment across the world is changing. While the COVID-19 pandemic remains a key risk, the global economy is expected to stage a smart recovery and log 5.8% growth in calendar 2021, according to the most recent outlook from S&P Global. This growth will, however, be seen, however, be uneven and shaped to a large extent by the progress on vaccination. India has rebounded strongly from a severe second wave, and we are on track to achieving 9.5% real growth this fiscal. Much of this depends on how the third wave plays out. The vaccination rate has been very impressive, which gives us hope that if there is a third wave, it, it would be a mild one. Despite high year-on-year -year growth numbers, the level of economic activity this fiscal will only be 1.5% above financial year 2020 levels. Amid all this, inflation has staged a comeback across the world at a time when central banks across the world have started normalizing their ultra easy monetary policies, while some others are planning to do so. Inflation is a concern in India as well, given the surge in crude oil prices and supply side bottlenecks. RBI in its recent monetary policy stayed accommodative as the recovery has been uneven. Clearly, Mintro doesn't as yet want to call the ongoing recovery sustainable. We believe RBI will be tolerant of inflation till the COVID-19 pandemic abates significantly, and there is broad basing of recovery. However, liquidity normalization will gain pace in the coming months. We expect a rate lift off in the early part of 2022, assuming a milder third wave. Global policy developments bring back the taper tantrum worries of 2013, when India saw capital outflows and rupee volatility. I look forward to a stimulating discussion today on evolving growth inflation dynamics, central bank actions and their implications, especially for India. Over to you, Pankhuri, to take up the next slide. Thank you, Amish, for sharing your thoughts. We now have a presentation on India's macroeconomic setting amid global monetary policy developments. And to present the same, I would like to invite Ms. Deepti Deshpande, Principal Economist at Crystal. Deepti contributes to Crystal's economic research agenda. She also serves as spokesperson to media, clients, and key stakeholders on the macro narrative for India. Over to you, Deepti. Thank you, Pankari. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for taking the time out to join this webinar today. Over the next couple of minutes, I will share with you our views on the expectation of domestic monetary policy actions amid global monetary policy developments and overlaying this, the macro setting for the Indian economy. Globally, growth is on a strong footing 
and that bodes well for overall economy, overall recovery. But there is some unevenness in growth patterns that is being observed. In its most recent release, S&P Global uh, revised up its 2021 growth forecasts for Eurozone and many emerging market economies as macro conditions looked stronger there. Growth forecasts were, however, pulled down for the US and China in response to signs of weaknesses. Broadly, though, risks remain somewhat uh, tilted to the downside given the uncertainty around the pandemic and the elevated debt levels as well as high inflation, both of which reduce the available policy space. In today's webinar, we focus on what the exit from easy monetary policy towards normalcy entails for the global setting and specifically for the Indian economy. In India too, domestically, the recovery remains uneven, but the economy is steadily and gradually ticking up. We expect GDP growth to come in at 9.5% in fiscal 2022, and we believe this will be supported by global recovery that supports exports, the recent pickup in the pace of vaccination, which bodes well for some of the most hit sectors, especially in the contact-based services space, which were hit hard by high rate of infections, restrictions, and other social distancing norms. Overall, we believe consumer and business sentiments will take time to revive. This will be very unlike the previous occasions when these two agents played a crucial role in pulling out the economy out of the slowdown. Instead, government capex, both by the center and state, are expected to do most of the heavy lifting. Going forward, we believe that as the pace of vaccination increases and the entire adult population gets fully vaccinated by early 2022, these Lagarde sectors will stage a catch up over the subsequent quarters. Fiscal 2023, therefore, is also expected to see relatively strong growth and this should also be more broad based. Meanwhile, in India too, with inflation staying relatively elevated, monetary policy space remains constrained. There is a further constraint with global central banks looking now at a return towards tapering liquidity infusions. The shifting landscape of global monetary policy, especially in the US, could now test vulnerabilities for emerging markets such as India. For some of these, normalization talks bring back painful, brings back painful memories from 2013 taper tantrum when several of these currencies fell sharply against the US dollar. At that time, the Indian rupee had itself weakened on average 14% against the US dollar, making it part of the fragile five. A look at some of the key macros for India at the moment suggests that we are better off on the external front compared to 2013 but domestic macros are somewhat weaker. A look at India's growth trajectory going forward suggests that growth is expected to stay strong until fiscal 2023, but slows thereafter as the one-time bounce effect coming in from the Lagarde sectors starts fading out. We then expect GDP growth to settle somewhere around 6 to 6.5% in the years that follow. Some softening in global growth will also play a role here, but the trajectory is expected to be mainly influenced by a very gradual pickup in consumption and private sector manufacturing activity. Some support is expected to come in from continued government spending on infra investment, some deleveraged corporates supporting the investment cycle, and payoffs from reforms such as the production linked incentive scheme and stabilization of the GST such that efficiencies start kicking in. On the global front too, after a period of strong recovery, economic activity is expected to soften as the impact of fiscal stimulus and the one-time lift effect fades. This will be accompanied by a gradual exit from easy monetary and fiscal policies. A few central banks, if we see, are already en route to reversal in their easy monetary policy stance. This chart, for instance, which you see is a global monetary policy tracker that covers 54 countries, most of these being inflation targeting. The index ranges from a minus 10 to plus 10, where minus 10 indicates that all countries are easing and a plus 10 indicates that they are all tightening. On the far right of the graph, future rate move expectations are shown in orange. 
The key point to note here is that despite an expectation of turn in monetary policies, conditions are unlikely to tighten as much in the coming quarters. This is because major central banks that are systemically more important in driving global capital flows are expected to take very gradual and calibrated move towards normalcy. This shows the overall picture, but the regional level dynamics are also important and interesting. The world maps here indicate how some parts of the world are seeing tighter monetary policies compared to earlier January this year. In these maps, tightening policies indicated in red, loosening is in the blue. The key takeaway here is that while some have bitten the bullet and hiked policy rates, and few others have begun to taper uh, their asset purchase programs, the larger ones like the US and ECB are yet to move. This brings us to our own domestic monetary policy setting. We see here that the repo rate, the policy repo rate is currently the lowest that we've seen in the last 10 to 12 years, despite inflation staying closer to the RBI's upper tolerance band for the consumer price index. The respite over the last three months that we've been seeing is largely on account of food inflation dropping to below 1% now. But it's a non-food inflation that remains rigid, close to around 6%. In fact, elevated oil and commodity prices and the continued pass through of input costs by manufacturers onto consumers seems to exert further upside risks, risks on this component of CPI inflation. The question then arises is that why is RBI more tolerant of in higher inflation this time around? And to us, there are perhaps two answers to that. First is that growth appears to be a foremost concern now. The pickup so far is gradual, somewhat fraught with risks, and is happening at a much slower pace than desired. Then there are also pockets in the economy that are yet to see a sustained revival. Any move on the monetary policy front that pushes up interest rates, for instance, in the economy, could come in the way of this st steady and smooth pickup. So the RBI is perhaps maintaining caution on that front. The second and more important point is that the RBI is also looking at the nature of inflation, which so far broadly looks supply side driven. The coming months, however, could see some change in this scene. We believe that as growth strengthens, demand conditions could improve and fuel inflation. That is when the RBI could likely move. In its recent review, the Monetary Policy Committee signaled a gradual move towards normalization. We expect this gradual normalization to continue over a few months and a 25 basis points hike in the repo rate to come, come in by some towards the end of fiscal 2022. Meanwhile, financial conditions in the economy remain easier than a year ago, and that is comforting. Crystal's financial conditions index is displayed here, which is constructed by combining 15 key parameters across equity, debt, forex, and money markets and that is combined with information on policy and lending conditions. The index moving up towards the dotted line at the top suggests easier financial conditions. If the index drops and approaches the dotted line at the bottom, it means financial conditions are tightening as they did in early 2020 when the pandemic struck here, struck India and we saw quite a bit of capital outflows. Overall, the index suggests easy financial conditions as monetary policy remains accommodative. Despite the RBI taking small steps in recent months towards normalization, that is not yet showing up in the financial conditions index, as you might see. In fact, conditions turned easier in September due to the excess liquidity overhang. Now, with withdrawal of global monetary policy stimulus, that typically tends to create a fear of a risk of behavior causing capital to leave emerging markets goes closer to safe haven securities. On the whole, we believe that the intensity of normalization shock this time could be less sharp. In fact, if we look at India's vulnerability, given this backdrop, that appears a mixed picture. We are currently, like I said earlier, stronger externally, but somewhat weaker domestically. For instance, the external position is stronger than 2030, with the current account deficit ratio substantially lower, the external debt and liabilities in the safe zone and a tough forex shield 
to cover these liabilities as well as imports. But it is the domestic macroeconomic health that is weaker after the pandemic. Even with a strong GDP growth of 9.5% in fiscal 2022, we'd only be 1.5% above our pre-pandemic level of real GDP. Similarly, on the inflation front, we expect the CPI inflation to be somewhat lower this fiscal compared to the last, and it's also going to be lower than what we saw in fiscal 2014, that's the year of the taper tantrum. But that could still be a worry to investors as inflation this year, the, the lower inflation this year is still on a high base of last year. Also, the government's debt position is, uh, is, is somewhat more under strain this time around. Finally, global investors also look at peer performance. Compared to six of our emerging market peers, India's macro indicators lay somewhere in the middle. India ranks fourth in terms of its catch up to pre pandemic level of GDP. It has the third highest inflation rate and highest ratio of government debt to GDP. Finally, to sum, the Indian economy is emerging from the shadow of the second wave. Similar to other central banks, the RBI is also signaling a gradual move towards normalization, and we expect this to continue for a few months. The coming months, however, could see a rise in uncertainty as global developments unfold, leading to capital volatility. As for the risks, a surprise tightening by advanced uh, uh, economy central banks in the environment of uneven recovery could be one risk that we see. The other is, is the domestic inflation threat. That brings me to the end of this presentation. I'd like to hand over this session back to Pankari. Thank you. Thank you, Deepti, for an insightful presentation. We now move to our much awaited panel discussion of the day on global monetary policy developments and their implications for India. It is my great honor to introduce our esteemed panelists to the audience. We have with us Dr. D. Subbarao, former governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Prior to serving as governor of RBI, Dr. Subbarao has been finance secretary to the government of India, secretary to the prime minister's economic advisory council and lead economist at the World Bank and has vast experience in monetary policy and public finance management. Next, we have with us Mr. B. Prasanna, group head, global markets, sales, trading and research at ICICI Bank Limited. He is also the chairman of ICICI Securities Primary Dealership and is the current vice chairman of FIMDA. He has rich experience in the Indian Treasury markets and has been a part of various committees formed by RBI, SEBI, and FIMDA for the development of new products in India. Next, we have with us Dr. Beth Ann Bovino, Chief U.S. Economist at S&P Global Ratings. Dr. Beth Ann has decades of experience in U.S. economic research and developing its forecasts. We also have with us Dr. Sylvain Breuer, Chief Economist for Europe, Middle East and Africa at S&P Global Ratings. Dr. Sylvain has been a member of the ECB Shadow Council, a panel of leading European economists, and is a member of different public sector advisory groups in Europe. This panel will be moderated by Mr. Dharmakirti Joshi, Chief Economist at Crystal. At Crystal, he leads the economic research agenda and is the primary spokesperson for Crystal on macroeconomic issues. A warm welcome to each one of our panel members. I now hand over to DK to proceed with the panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pankhudi. Uh, hello, everyone, and once again, welcome to the panel discussion. Uh, we all, I think, as was being told by uh, my colleagues earlier, the, as the recovery across the world gains hold, the tolerance to inflation is waning. And uh, so uh, in this environment, yesterday IMF came out with its uh, World Economic Outlook and the two words stuck with me uh, in their title. They said that recovery, global recovery continues amid increasing uncertainty and more complex policy trade-off. So today we, we are going to discuss, I think, what's going to happen in the one of the two most important central banks, ECB and uh, Federal Reserve, 
how what's happening to the economies there and how the central banks will react and uh, what its implications for for india would be uh, from a regulatory perspective i think uh, from a central bank perspective as well as from the markets perspective and to discuss all this we have four very eminent experts who were uh, introduced by pankhudi a few minutes back so we have about 45 minutes for the discussion and 15 minutes for the question and answer uh, so i would request the audience to type in their questions and if uh, uh, if if they blend in with the questions i'm going to ask i think we can combine them together uh, so let me let me begin with the uh, uh, the the economies for which we are waiting uh, uh, awaiting action and i think that's uh, let me begin with us first uh, with uh, dr bethan Uh, in September, you had revised the globe, uh, the uh, the outlook for the U.S. economy, and uh, the interestingly growth was uh, uh, was brought down, and uh, the the inflation is still uh, in somewhat sticky but considered transitory. So, how do you expect the growth inflation dynamics to play out, both in the near term as well as uh, over the medium run? it would be great if you could touch upon the employment and wage pressure aspects as well so basically how would the central bank frame its glide uh, glide path for uh, for its monetary policy uh, over the next uh, couple of months over to you uh, bethan okay sure uh, well it's great to be here everyone first i wanted to to say that uh, uh, so what are we expecting we did we did revise down our forecast from we had uh, in june we had 6.7% growth for uh, the united states that's annualized average growth down to uh, we brought it down a whole percentage point to around 5.7 percentage point uh, growth now the main driver behind that and i think the rest of the world um, is experiencing this as well is a uh, supply chain bottlenecks um the, uh, the the disruptions in the economy uh both a, you know after the pandemic has uh, caused well things can't get things can't, can't move uh businesses can't get the fruit the product that they need to uh, to make the product and in tide of that in tide of that with the reopening effect people are spending people are outdoors in the united states so you're seeing huge demand and businesses just can't keep up um that was one of the reasons why well, that's one of the major reasons why we saw growth us uh, um revised down sharply to um by 1% still that 5.7% growth rate for the united states is still a 70 a 37 year high so it's incredibly significant and, and very robust what does that mean for um inflation dynamics Uh, given that given that given that uh, growth is incredibly strong given that demand is still surging and businesses are still trying to uh, keep up uh, but the bottlenecks uh, in the in the supply chains are slowing them down that means inflation has picked up dramatically uh, we talked about products dk you mentioned uh, you know the, uh, the the inflation dynamic well uh, in terms of uh, cpi we're expecting to see well right now um, inflation is incredibly high and we're looking at numbers uh, well over 4% in for so well over 4% uh and it's and it's likely to stay high over uh through this year and into the next uh that's just product uh we've also seen you mentioned employment readings employment readings have weakened in the most recent uh uh most recent September and October uh job gains which kind of calls to question what the fed will do um they uh, were a little soft relative to the many uh basically the over 7 million people that are still on the out of the workforce and many um out of you know not uh, unemployed and the many people who are still out of the workforce so what does that mean well even though um the job the jobs are weak Uh, at that point we don't think that's going to slow the job um slow the fed down we think this is more transitory in terms of the um again bottlenecks also in the jobs force we're expecting the fed to continue with tapering largely because wages we mentioned wa- you mentioned wages as well even though jobs are we- had jobs were relatively weak wage gains are incredibly strong um they have not gone into what you would call um shown up into inflation expectations so that means that we're not seeing a uh, persistence in the inflation readings uh as opposed to transitory it still seems largely transitory at this point in time but that doesn't mean the fed will won't stop we do expect the fed to um to uh, announce tapering in in november and we think that will start in december with a much quicker a quicker response than we thought bringing bringing purchases down to zero by mid 2000 uh, mid 2022 with the first rate first rate hike later year end in 2022 Yeah uh, uh Bethan if I may just ask a very quick follow up I mean uh, uh, we've been hearing uh, or rather reading a lot about stagflation these days and I think this was uh, this term had disappeared for quite some time and I think has made a comeback and I think almost 
there is a set of economists, at least they are in the minority right now, but they are talking pretty loudly about stagflation. So is it too far-fetched at this juncture or I mean, should we be monitoring it or uh, considering it as a possibility? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, in this, in these unprecedented times, you can't rule anything out. However, I would put uh, the, the risk of stag stagflation at this point in time is very, very slim. We right now, yes, we do have incredibly high inflation readings. Um, you know, it's really makes your eyes, you know, will go wide open when you see them. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time with stagflation, you would need one, you would have certainly persistent high inflation, we don't see a persistence yet. A lot of this is seems to be, uh, seems to be transitory. A good example are uh, what's happening with commodity prices, not all but a number of commodity prices like lumber, iron ore have started to fall down back to back to earth, I guess you could say. Um, so that that's one, one idea to suggest that things are still somewhat transitory transitory in terms of the on the inflation front high but in um in uh transitory the other thing you would need for stagflation you would need high unemployment we have unemployment now i believe it dropped to 4.8 i figure there was the number was for the united states and that also is with so many people um still people out of the market and with job openings incredibly tight so i think this the jobs market is incredibly tight does not fall into the stagflation front um and certainly we are not seeing stagnant demand people want to spend it's just they can't find the product on the shelves. Right. Uh, now, I think moving from Fed to the uh, to the European Central Bank, uh, as uh, Sylvain, as Bethan pointed out that uh, the, the US growth has been lowered and I think the, the policy normalization uh, timeline has also been moved forward. Uh, but I think Europe has a somewhat different scenario playing out. I think you've notched up the growth outlook for Europe and the inflation is relatively benign, I mean, compared to definitely compared to US. Why is this uh, scenario in Europe so different from that in US? Uh, is inflation not a big concern for Europe? And as a corollary, uh, if I may ask that, what will this mean for ECB's uh, uh, normalization uh, trajectory? Yeah, thanks, DK, for the, for the question. So I think it's unique. So if we consider that uh, the Eurozone economy is likely to rebound as much as the US economy this year, around 5%, maybe a bit, a bit more than 5%, and to grow more next year, 4.5%, it's more than our expectation for the US economy, by a much lower inflation. So the, uh, I could say the Eurozone had, um, has had a, a good pandemic.
I think from there, let me now uh, move to India and to you, Dr. Subarao. I think this relates to a fundamental question of uh, global influences on domestic monetary policy. We always say that uh, I think the Indian monetary policy will be dictated by, uh, by the domestic conditions, but our eyes are focused on what the Fed and the ECB are doing. I mean, always, I mean, the newspapers are very quick to report that. So, uh, I mean, can, I mean, uh, is it, can India monetary policy in any way ignore the systemically important central banks i mean if they begin to normalize i mean does it put pressure uh, pressure on, on 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 the on the domestic monetary authorities as well well we certainly we can, just cannot ignore what's happening in advanced economies after all in every monetary policy statement we see at least two to three paragraphs of what's happening in advanced economies so what happens in advanced economies has implications for our growth, for our inflation, and our financial stability. After all, the price of every financial instrument in the world is in some sense benchmarked to the price of the U.S. 10-year treasury. So if the U.S. Fed normalizes its policy, it will have implications for prices in the financial markets and in the real economy everywhere including in India, and I think the RBA will have to react. Uh, you know, I think of it in terms of the impossible trinity argument that no country can at the same time have an open capital account, a fixed exchange rate, and an independent monetary policy. The fact is that billions of dollars of capital has flowed into India because of the quantitative basic. And when the Fed normalizes, well, and rich countries normalize, some of that capital is going to go back and that will uh, have implications for uh, capital outflow. And some of the burden of that adjustment will have to be borne by the exchange rate and some of the burden of that adjustment by the monetary policy. So RPA will have to react either through monetary policy or through exchange rate policy when the advanced economies normalize. Now, I just want to tell you uh, a, a little anecdote. You know, when I was governor and one of those uh, G20 meetings, a governor of an emerging economy asked then Chairman Ben Bernanke that, look, uh, we, when we make a policy, we look at what America is doing, what Europe is doing, we write about that in our policy. Do you, when you make your policy, do you ever think about us, what's happening to our economies? And his response was a sheepish smile. So uh, in a fin financially integrated world, what happens in America, what happens in Europe, what happens in rich countries, high implications for India and for emerging markets, and RPA will have to respond to that. Right. Uh, so I think I, I'll come back to you on, uh, I think, on the domestic inflation uh, dynamics uh, in a bit. But I think uh, uh, let me go over to be with that kind of a backdrop that this is an, a problem which you cannot ignore. Uh, coming to Mr. Prasanna. Well, I think the it's true that developing economies are generally more uh, exposed to financial shock, shocks. And by going by the past experience, I think the capital flows, exchange rates and the monetary policy get impacted, as Dr. Subara was saying. Uh, I think the the vulnerability to some extent probably depends also on how much capital has come into the country. I mean, if the more capital has come, then I think you are in a way more exposed, even if your I think macros are are healthy. So, how do you see this play out and impact Indian markets? Already, we are seeing so much volatility in uh, in, in 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 currency market. Uh, just could you put that in context? Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, before I answer that question, many thanks to Krizil for including me in the panel. And it's really a great privilege to be uh, to be sharing uh, the uh, dais, even if it's a virtual dais, along with uh, Dr. Subarao. Thanks, uh, many, many thanks for that. Uh, and uh, also in the fitness of things, I think you've got the markets person to follow the regulator, right? And that's what would have probably happened in real life as well. We always listen to what the governor says, now he's listening to what the ex-governor says. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question... Uh, uh, DK, I think, uh, see, uh, inflows and outflows are a part of uh, 
uh, every uh, global uh, economy and uh, uh, the greater the integration uh, the greater uh, the flows are uh, both uh, both sides and we all need to be prepared for that and like how the gov uh, ex governor said that it is pretty clear about uh, the way even the central banks think about it uh, but i think i wanted to bring in to point uh, uh, a point that uh, over the last uh, you know couple of years it's actually the good quality for us what we call as the stable flows which have actually come into uh, the indian economy i mean you could see in the last uh, couple of years around 0.5% of gdp flows uh, is what has uh, you know come in in the form of uh, both equity as well as debt and yes post the qe we have seen a large uh, flow that is coming in but that also needs to be uh, you know in the context seen with respect to what happened in immediate pre covid period the january to march 2020 period when there was actually substantial outflows so to some extent the inflows which happened on the equity side post uh, covid post lockdown was also to some extent a reversal of the outflow which happened before that and moreover if you actually see during the last two years uh, india has actually not seen a uh, surprise uh, surprise uh, any net incremental flow on the debt segment and almost the entire flows were on account of equities and that's why uh, that's what i meant by saying uh, are the flows the good quality flows or the so called you know the uh, the hot uh, volatile uh, flows and on equities if you really uh, think about it i think the narrative uh, remains uh, really benign of course i do agree with a lot of what uh, uh, deepthi said in her presentation very well made uh, but you have to take into account the fact that the twin balance sheets of corporate india and the banking system is improving there are multiple revival uh, uh, prospects coming from the it sector the pharma sector the revival in real estate uh, the multi year booms which are happening in associated sectors so corporate uh, india is uh, reviving in a big way deleveraging is also helping them to show better and better balance sheets we do expect nifty earnings to actually uh, grow by 18 to 25% over the next 3 uh, to 4 years and so even though valuation looks straight it just looks like we are continuing to uh, going to continue to attract uh, flows it's going to be very difficult for any uh, foreign entrepreneur foreign investor to actually ignore uh, india at this particular point of time so overall i would say the construct remains very very positive for uh, capital allocation from an equity perspective Uh, which incidentally has not happened so far recently but i would say long term flows will come back in as far as bond market is concerned uh, i mean like i said we have not seen uh, really big inflows on the bond market side in 2020 and 2021 uh, just before the index inclusion noise uh, started uh, coming over the wires we saw some amount of uh, fpi uh, buying uh, bonds but more or less i think uh, i would say Uh, we have not received the hot money flows and uh, uh, whenever the uh, index inclusion happens i think we would be uh, deluged with a substantial amount of in, uh, money which can uh, possibly come in so at this point of time i am not too perturbed by uh, the possibility of substantial outflows uh, happening i'll probably give it back to you dk now and maybe some of these points i can touch upon if i have time later sure sure thanks uh, uh, I, let me i think come back to dr subarao I think sir uh, uh, I remember you talking about fiscal dominance of monetary policy I think couple of years back I still remember a TV interview that you had done uh, India's India government's debt level has also risen pretty significantly post pandemic uh, so is is this uh, 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 situation a more potent threat today where I think the fiscal policy will somehow influence how the monetary policy is conducted I would say more potent, but I think fiscal dominance is still quite a potent threat in India. All of you know that over the last twenty-five years, we've done several things to mitigate fiscal dominance over monetary policy. Um, just to recap very quickly, there is no longer any act of treasury bond. There is no automatic monetization under the FRBM, the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act. the rbi is prohibited from uh, entering the primary market in other words prohibited from directly monetizing the government's deficit the slr the stat statutory liquidity ratio which is some sort of financial repression uh mandating banks to hold a certain amount of designated securities like government securities that's come down and most importantly we now have fiscal rules by the ffrbi under we now have monetary policy governed by an inflation targeting framework and an fpc so a lot of safeguards are in place 
But in spite of that, I believe that there is still scope for fiscal dominance in India. And uh, if uh, I, I, the, especially because the government's borrowing has been quite significant over the last several years, and that the finance minister has also bargained for a more conservative fiscal easing path than the market or all of us had expected, for a government borrowing is going to be significantly higher than we had expected for the next several years. We just have to take into account not just the central government borrowing, but the borrowing of the central and state governments. And given that the RBI uh, is mandated to manage the government's debt, is mandated to ensure financial stability, the fact that the government is borrowing so much will curtail its decreased freedom. And to that extent, monetary policy will come under fiscal dominance. We have not seen it very much in the past one, one and a half years because private investment demand has been quite low. But when it picks up as we want it to and as we expect it to over the next maybe six months or so, uh, this fiscal dominance will come in there and RBI will have to negotiate this very carefully. So the short answer to your question, DK, is that in spite of all the safeguards built over the last 20, 25 years, fiscal dominance is still quite a potent threat in India. And we might see it actually manifest over the next uh, several years. Right, right sir. Uh, I think now in that context, let me uh, get back to uh, to Bethan. I think the the uh, we've seen that interest rates are almost I mean were very low in the U.S. The bond yields. The so if if there is a lift in interest rates and given the huge amount of debt accumulation and that the maturity structure of debt has shortened, uh, will it, I mean, um, will it not create uh, disruption in the system? So I think so that forcing the monetary policy to remain a little easier uh, uh, than it usually would. I mean, what I mean is that the boundary between fiscal and monetary policy getting somewhat blurred, I mean, here. I, uh, I, I see the... Actually, other people have asked the similar questions like that, and it is a concern. People would worry about something like that. However, I would, uh, you know, much as um, you know, our our colleague just had mentioned on India, for the United States, we have safeguards to prevent something like that, so that the Fed would, uh, you know, there would no be there wouldn't be a move for the Fed to, in a sense, monetize debt. Would be one example right. uh, of something like that. And why is that? We have uh, in the United States, the Fed has two mandates, actually three mandates, I guess, as well now. But um, you know, first, uh, um, sus uh, um, sustainable pricing. Uh, uh, so basically, pri um, pricing pr inflation that stays within a target. Uh, the target now is an average two is two percent target for uh, for uh, the per they usually look at the personal consumption expenditures index, uh, and so two percent target year over year. They average it now, so they give it a little bit of a, a kind of a, a little bit of a kind of a, a margin around that, I guess you could say. But two percent target for um, that they've had now for a number of years. Uh, but also, this would also be with Mac, um, their other mandate is to maximize employment. Those are the two factors. They certainly look at, uh, um, uh, they, also, they also take into account uh, uh, market risk as well so that they, um, they play that as well. But in those two cases, they, um, to go for, um, in a sense, like uh, worrying about uh, the US government in terms of government um, uh, finances, if they took that, um, that would be ignoring their two other mandates. And so I don't see that actually coming out to play. And I think that that Fed would also lose their credibility if they even, even if there was a suggestion of that. So I, hard I hardly imagine uh, that happening in the United States. Um, your other question, if I, what your other question was what in terms of market unrest? What was that other question? No, no, I I was saying that uh, if the interest rate is very is interest rate is very low in US, if the bond yields let's say double, I think the interest payments of the government will exert huge pressure on the finances. I mean, so uh, I think so. Is that a worry? I mean, going ahead or um, so in terms of so the the worry the so right now um, at least on um, let's let's take the short term interest rates for the Fed. What we're expecting, um, of course, you know the worry of. Um, was brought up a really stagflation or a persistence in inflation, uh, inflation rates where the Fed would have to move much for much faster. The, the you know the question of would we see a disorderly uh, re reinflation of the United States? Um, 
I don't necessarily, that's not our baseline. That yeah. certainly could happen and that would force the Fed to move much more quickly. We, um, we are expecting, I might have said this already, we're expecting um, five rate hikes in total through 2024. That would bring uh, interest rates to about, uh, I guess, um, you know, one, one, uh, one percent, one, one and a quarter percent to one and a half percent. Uh, that's, that's one third what is the historical average for the federal funds rate. So it is still rather low. Um, could they move faster? Uh, yes, I guess they could. We don't think that's likely, but that could certainly be the case. I would be worried more, not necessarily on the near term in terms of the um, in terms of higher interest rates on the federal government, the federal debt that's being held. I would say over the medium to long term, the risk is that the Fed will continue to raise rates. And even if the Fed doesn't necessarily raise rates, what will happen over to the medium to the long term interest rates? When will the rest of the world say, well, you know, particularly when other countries are raising their rates, when will the rest of the world say we, we demand higher interest interest in order to fund your uh, government debt? Um, there would be the crowding out effect um, for the United States. And that certainly is um, a real that is a real concern, medium to long term. Near term, it's not a, it's not an issue, I believe at all. Right, right. Uh, if I may pose the same similar question to uh, to to Sylvain also, because I think uh, the euro was obviously built on monetary policy dominance. I mean, uh, or in, I mean, independence, so to say. Uh, and uh, the the debt in Europe else has also gone up. And but I think within Europe, there's a huge amount of heterogeneity with respect to. Uh, to different economies, I mean. So, how does this play out in Europe? I mean, the the the, the excess debt uh, does it influence the monetary policy in any way? Yeah. That's a very difficult question to answer from the European perspective, because, as I said, so we have for the first time coordination of fiscal and monetary policy stimulus. That, that does not mean that we have a subordination of monetary policy to, uh, to fiscal policy and that we have a fiscal dominance. There are rules for fiscal policy in Europe. So the budget must be balanced. That means the, the structural deficit of governments must not, must, must not exceed 0.5% uh, of GDP in the general case. Um, and we have a debt anchor. So governments uh, which have more than 60% of GDP debt uh, should reduce this overhead this overhang by one twentieth a year on average until they reach the target of 60%. These fiscal rules have been relaxed during the pandemic, um, but they, they will be reinstalled in 2023 with some minor changes, uh, for instance, allowing governments to invest a bit more in, in, in green. Um, um, but these rules uh, are protecting monetary policy for, from, from fiscal dominance. Uh, they are important. Um, same thing as in the UK, there is a ban on overdraft facilities for government at, uh, at the central bank, and there is a ban on monetization of debt. So um, the contract, the European contract says, if not monetary dominance, at least monetary policy, independence of monetary policy. Having said that, and it's a, a bit of the, the, the same kind of answer I would give uh, that, that um, uh, Bessan uh, 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 said, uh, the risk is to have some fiscal dominance uh, through the back door because of the mandate of the ECB um, to ensure financial stability. Public debt is high. If, and you said it, if interest rates goes up, uh, then uh, we might, uh, it might, they might lead to a situation where um, financial stability is no more granted. So uh, it's a bit difficult for the ECB to find the right balance. And um, yeah, so explicitly, we do not have fiscal dominance. Through the back door, it's, it's different. And um, it's, it's difficult for the European economy to cope with higher interest rates. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Thanks. I think with that, I think let me move to the markets. And uh, so, uh, Mr. Prasanna, how concerned or rather relieved, I mean, because the fiscal deficit seems to be a little lower than what uh, government has budgeted. So how, uh, so my question is how concerned or relieved are you or the markets are with the evolving fiscal situation, both in the near term as, as well as in the medium term, because this is one of the very closely watched numbers by the markets. Yeah, thanks, GK. So actually, contrary to uh, being relieved, actually, of course, there is a relief that uh, the government's uh, tax collections are going to improve with uh, uh, the kind of uh, growth in tax collect, uh, the kind of growth we are seeing in the economy with corporate sector doing well and so on and so forth. 
but I think the bigger uh, uh, decision or the bigger uh, parameter that we need to look at is what's happening to the demand and supply. And there, if you actually see post-COVID, I mean, you would all know that uh, fiscal deficit has gone up from 3.5 to uh, 9 and then came down to 6.8. So uh, even if it is 6.2 or 6.3 or whatever, it's still substantially higher than where we were averaging pre-COVID. And immediately post-COVID, there was a logical reason as to why the central bank wanted to get into the government bond market. And they came in very aggressively for all the right reasons. And now for the first time last week, we have actually seen uh, the government indicating that liquidity is uh, quite a bit and we are in surplus and they might not want to add net liquidity to the system anymore. And they have removed uh, GSAP uh, from their uh, policy tool. And they're saying that we are going to be doing ad hoc uh, OMOs and operation twists uh, as and when required. So if you really look at the demand supply, one significant demand which was coming from the Reserve Bank of India, which is around uh, 4.5 trillion uh, every year, is actually not going to be there. And so how is the market going to uh, manage it becomes one question. So I think we will uh, uh, you know, feel for the stones as we cross the river, so to speak, and figure out whether the market can handle it in the current uh, uh, interest rate uh, range. The second thing is, of course, not from the demand and supply and the fiscal perspective, is it's, is, is from the monetary policy uh, perspective itself. And, uh, of course, we all know that the RBI didn't hide the reverse repo rate last week, but, of course, they have indicated uh, that they will be sucking out liquidity using the VRRR, uh, which basically means that today the opportunity cost of funding for the banking system uh, can potentially go up from, uh, say, 335 or around about 335 to something like 390, 95 levels. And that will definitely have its implications on the short end and, uh, and other asset classes, which are priced off uh, the uh, the rate at which uh, banks lend money to Reserve Bank. So I think to some extent, we have started the policy normalization uh, last week. The formal uh, announcement of a reverse repo hike and all we can possibly expect next uh, 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 next policy. But I guess uh, uh, there are a lot of things to contend with. And then if you add uh, the global scenario, which uh, my colleagues have spoken in detail uh, into the concoction, you have a uh, rising bondings uh, in, uh, in uh, Germany, UK, and uh, the US. You have the monetary policy tightening uh, everywhere, the taper almost at our doors right now. What we have been talking for the last one year, it's uh, finally there. Uh, so I think uh, there are a lot of concern areas as well. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, 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 like uh, I think in your presentation also, I think Reserve Bank will be very, very gradual. Uh, so they might be there to prevent if bond deals were to go up. But I do expect, you know, uh, uh, the bond market to keep testing the Reserve Bank in terms of uh, where uh, they would like to come in to intervene in the auctions for, say, the 10-year security or the 14-year security as and when it happens. Back to you, DK. Right, right. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, I, I just wanted to jump in here just real quickly. Um, I, I'm listening to everybody. And uh, one thing I wanted to note is that we're talking about, uh, you know, basically many parts of the world are going to start tightening uh, monetary policy. And one of the things I just wanted to put into everybody's mind is that, isn't that in some ways a good thing? Because the economy, we've got the United States and the rest of the world have gotten out of one of the worst or slowly getting out of one of the worst uh, pandemic uh, induced uh, recession worldwide and that the, that monetary policy is now talking about tightening policy um, could be seen as a good thing because they, they believe the economies can hold, um, can hold withstand it. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, I mean, interest rate going up is in a sense a positive thing, but I think the problem is that it's happening. It's not uh, unlike, uh, unlike a uh, time when I think when you, we are, when we, when the economies are sinking, they sink, they also bring the interest rates down together. But I think when they revive, the revival happens very differentially. So different parts of the world move differently. I mean, uh, so that so that can create some sort of a, a problem. Well, Otherwise, DK, just, I, DK, just ten seconds. I think uh, the the concern is coming from a bond market perspective because obviously when interest rates go up, we will all need to worry about our portfolios and all that. But of course, like I said in the beginning, equities are doing well, and interest rates going up indirectly, like she's saying, means that. Uh, the economy is doing well so i guess that's something uh, absolutely i mean i completely agree i was just trying to uh, add a rather uh, uh, negative dimension to that i mean that it also i think there is a there is also a problem associated with uh, with with asymmetric tightening happening across the world uh, uh, so dr subarao let me come back to you again 
I think we've seen, I think all the central banks, we've heard from Bethan, we've heard from uh, Sylvan also, uh, the, they are trying to engineer a very smooth glide path for normalization of monetary policy, which doesn't disrupt. But there is a possibility of a surprise, always, I mean, which, uh, and uh, uh, is India in 2021 different from what it was in uh, 2013? And if it is, then in what way? So I just want to add an audience question to this as well, uh, which is that what measures the R uh, could the RBI possibly take to avoid a 2013-like situation in case there are sh sharp capital outflows? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think Deepti has completely answered that question in her presentation, but let me say it in my own words, which is that the 2021 situation is quite different from 2013. The similarity, of course, is that there's an, been an extraordinary amount of easing in advanced economies. That money has flown into emerging markets in search for yield. Prasanna just told us that it's gone more into equity markets than in bond market, but regardless, a lot of capital has come in, and at least some of it will reverse tack if, uh, when advanced economies raise their interest rates, normalize their policies. Uh, to that extent, 2013 is similar to 2021. But in 2013, we were part of the Fragile Five for a number of reasons, which are not present today. For example, the current account deficit. In 20 but 13, the current account deficit was high, above 4% for several years before that, indeed, in that year as well. A lot of pressure had built up uh, in the rupee. So uh, normally, current account deficit should have self-adjusted uh, through an exchange rate depreciation. That did not happen because money kept coming in. But this time around, current account deficit is low. Indeed, we had a current account surplus last year. This year is going to be quite low. There is no pressure in the rupee. In fact, just the current account deficit on foreign direct investment is by itself positive, which means that the current account deficit is fully financed by stable capital. So that's the first difference. The second difference between 2013 and 2021 is about fiscal deficit. Fiscal deficit was high then. Fiscal deficit is high today, but not so high as to cause any concerns on the exchange rate front. The third is the level of foreign exchange reserves, uh, both in absolute terms, uh, which are doubled today compared to what they were in 2013 and substantially more than what they were as a percentage of uh, GDP as well. So because of all these mitigating factors, I, do, I think we're quite well protected. Uh, from uh, uh, a fragile finance situation in 2013. And most importantly, the Fed has assured us repeatedly that they will telegraph their intention, they'll be patient, and they will uh, uh, you know, give us enough notice. But like you said, should they jump in as a knee-jerk reaction, there will be some concerns here. Now, how should the Reserve Bank respond to this? Uh, Naturally, uh, if uh, some capital flows out, there will be volatility in the exchange rate and RBI will enter the foreign exchange market to contain that volatility, which will be consistent with their policy. There is a view that, there's a view in India, that because we have strong foreign exchange reserves, we're insulated from global shocks. In my view, that is misinformed. We're not insulated from global shocks. Uh, we are, we, the global shock will still be felt here. Our foreign exchange reserves will help us manage that shock. So the presence of foreign exchange reserves, that we have foreign exchange reserves, does not protect us from the buildup of pressure. It protects us in managing that pressure. So when the Fed normalizes, as it will, I think the RBI will have to uh, intervene in the foreign exchange market, manage volatility. And I don't think they should uh, use the monetary policy instrument unless there is uh, uh, very strong pressure, which I don't expect. So at this time, uh, I think uh, just foreign exchange intervention will be sufficient to manage any volatility coming from uh, normalization of policy in advanced economies. Right, right, right. Uh, 
So, uh, Sylvain, I think if I may uh, uh, continue with, uh, with the issue of interest rates, I think there's a belief that we are entering an environment uh, where equilibrium interest rates will be much lower, I mean, so, uh, uh, and, and the elevated balance sheets will stay with us. So do you see this phenomena play out in, in Europe, I mean, where I think interest rates will be, will not, will never probably reach the level of uh, pre-COVID levels, I mean? Unfortunately, unfortunately, yes. So, um, I, I, I would like to, to agree with Bethan saying that uh, higher interest rates are good. Um, also for credits, but in the case of the European economy, I agree with you, uh, DK. Um, it's difficult to cope with higher interest rates, and um, we in in the eurozone we are at the zero low bound uh, for years now, uh, and we just have seen the first decade of low interest rates in in Europe. Um, the transmission of conventional monetary policy is questionable. Um, we have uh, so. European banks have limited scope to pass the negative interest rates to depositors. And um, if, you, if you read the, the, um, the strategy review that the ECB conducted this year, um, one of the conclusions is that the unconventional tools, monetary policy tools, uh, have, have become conventional. So QE, defined as injection of liquidity uh, via uh, bond purchase programs or via long-term financing operations to bank, uh, QE is here to stay in, in, in Europe. And we have a balance sheet, so the, the euro system has a balance sheet of 8.3 trillion of euros. Half of that is made of QE bond purchases. A quarter of that is made by long-term lending operation to banks. This will continue. And uh, as I said, the balance sheet will not start shrinking. The euro system balance sheet will not start shrinking before the end of this decade if there is no crisis in the, in, in the way, on the way. But that's another story. Right, right, right. And that, I think, coming back to you, Bethan, I mean, the, the, the US never experimented with negative interest rates. I mean, any particular reason why they preferred quantitative easing to... I think um, so. I, there had a number of uh, central bankers. I, I remember uh, former chair Bernanke had written about uh, negative interest rates. Uh, one of the concerns was uh, negative. You know, the you know negative interest rate policy responds somewhat similarly to quantitative easing policy. So, um, but there was a lot of concerns, particularly on the impact on banks, for example, uh, private, you know, private sector banks. Uh, also, what the range would be, where, what was the, I guess you could, could say the sweet spot for uh, negative interest rates was another question that was called into play. Um, so I think, uh, but I think the main reason why the, the Federal Reserve stuck with uh, quantitative easing, it was because it was tried and true. Um, it was the, uh, you know, it, we, it's not necessarily that uh, the Federal Reserve or I suppose any many other central banks like to go using um, these unconventional policies like uh, quantitative easing, but uh, when uh, you know, forced to do so, you go with what you've used before because you know how it works. And I think that was why they, could, they stuck with QE. Right, right. And there's an audience question which let me pose to you uh, right away. I think this says that if U.S. were to uh, raise interest rates uh, uh, much quicker than expected and much higher, uh, to much higher levels than expected, I mean, is there a risk, any risk of recession? Because the central banks at times are known to create recessions as well. Yes, um, the, uh, what is that? I, I, gosh, I haven't had it said in so long time. Um, the, uh, so let's first give you our risk of recession for the United States. We have it at uh, 10 to 15%. That's the lowest uh, um, assessment of uh, recession over the next 12 months in, we've hadn't, hadn't had that, uh, that reading or that uh, risk of recession figure of 10 to 15% for six years. So, so it seems unlikely uh, to that, uh, to the audience uh, question, you know, could you see, uh, could you see the Fed taking away the, uh, the punch bowl? And not only that, um, throwing it on the ground, so pieces of glass spread all over, uh, ruining the, uh, the US economy, certainly, and of course, the implications that would have for the rest of the world, as many others on this call had just talked about. Um, I would say that it seems like a very, very unlikely uh, possibility, but let's say the Fed would be, the Fed does not want to get behind the curve on, in, on inflation. And we are seeing incredibly strong, um, incredibly high readings. We are watching in particular what's happening with wages. Wages are now climbing higher. We saw most recently in the, um, in the, uh, the, 
the BLS uh, jobs report, we saw uh, wage gains go up to, uh, I think it was 4.6%, which was the highest in decades. Um, now, there's a lot of factors that could be composition effect, demographics playing into that, that, that could explain why that's so high. But another reading that we look out for wages, which is the um, it's something called the Federal Reserve, the Atlanta Federal Reserve uh, wage tracker, which um, kind of controls for those. Um, it, it's not as susceptible to uh, uh, compositional effects and, and other factors. That is also still high, and that is a concern. Um, do we, um, if we saw the Fed move very quickly, um, very quickly, so that the rate hikes that we have now of just five, say that was up, that was doubled to 10. Um, we don't have that necessarily in our forecast at all. But if that were to be the case, what would happen to our growth forecast? Right now we have uh, we have 5.7%. It would certainly be sharp, sharply brought down. I still don't necessarily see a, a recession risk at that point in time. Uh, much slower growth and it would feel like recession for many. But in the United States, I don't necessarily see that would actually cause recession at this point in time. The impact for the rest of the world, of course, would be a lot more painful. And I'm sure our colleagues would have something to say about that right now. Right, right. And uh, I think uh, 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 now I think I need to move to the markets again. Uh, uh, you had, uh, uh, Mr. Prasanna, you had mentioned uh, that the inclusion about inclusion of India in, uh, uh, in the global bond index and that, that it's going to have a favorable impact. Uh, so there's a crisis in China, uh, property market, Evergrande, Evergrande crisis, and that I think and there is a lot of a uh, of, of lot of uh, foreign uh, they have raised money abroad so i think so does if this crisis uh, uh, is going to dampen interest of, uh, of of foreign investors in chinese bonds i mean if that is that is a possibility then will is there a i mean will that lead to more flows into india i mean is that because the smaller asian countries probably can't absorb that much uh, uh, that much capital yeah. So, uh, DK, I'll try to answer that question in two parts. So, the first is active, uh, you'll have to look at uh, whether fund managers are active manager of funds or their passive management of funds. Uh, so, what by virtue of not being in the index uh, all along, the kind of inflows that we have been attracting so far are all active funds, funds which have to beat the index in some form or the other. And they are trying to pick up an alpha by investing in uh, bonds which are not in the index if the macroeconomic environment is favorable and if they feel that uh, the bonds will outperform. So India was attracting uh, funds uh, only when our macroeconomic uh, uh, parameters were extremely good. And in a situation when we were not good, we were getting outflows. Now, what happens when we get included in the bond index is that a whole lot of AEMs which are just tracking the index, will uh, these are passive money and they will come in irrespective of whether uh, whatever be the situation, as long as the AEMs of the global bond uh, uh, funds are actually going up. So that is the, uh, basically the reason why I think there is a huge benefit if we get into uh, bond indices and we will be attracting passive fund flows uh, as long as the bond AEMs are there. And by the last count, we might be benef getting benefit to the extent of even $30 billion if we were getting included in the JP Morgan Emerging Market Bond Index uh, for starters. Now, uh, to answer your question on uh, the Chinese uh, thing. So that is where the active uh, uh, funds really uh, come in. And I think the credit issues in uh, the Chinese uh, real estate sector are, are de definitely a wake-up call uh, for global investors to kind of diversify their sources uh, into other emerging market, uh, you know, uh, emerging market bonds. Uh, so uh, right now, if you have, if you do really look at India, you have a confluence of a growing domestic economy you have a stable external account, uh, a huge uh, reserves, independent monetary authority, which is very, very credible with a long-term inflation uh, uh, targeting framework. So all this uh, seems uh, uh, to indicate that uh, given a chance, uh, global flows and savings can move into India. Uh, by the way, the issues in China didn't actually start from Evergrande. It actually started from the tech, set, uh, the tech sector uh, crackdown and the common prosperity theme where they actually, you know, almost it's like telling private sector cannot make any profits in certain sectors that the state is defining. So the risks of investing in China has been suddenly discovered by a whole lot of investors. So like I was saying, Indian sovereign right now offers a very good investment avenue because of all the factors that uh, uh, we had, uh, you know, kind of outlined. And we have, have had lower volatility of the currency so far. 
we have had a higher sharp ratio i am sure all the investors will you know uh, look at uh, all of these when they look at it the actual problem is actually been from a corporate side has been the lack of supply uh, from indian corporates due to actually the lower onshore yields than the hedged offshore yields like a corporate who is actually getting money in indian markets is able to borrow cheaper here than actually going out and borrowing in dollar and converting it into rupee and uh, so uh, so what our experience shows that we have seen a lot of investors actually wanting indian credits they are telling us that uh, please go and source uh, indian credits and we'll be happy to uh, invest but unfortunately not too many uh, investors there is a, there is not uh, an economic case for too many issuers to actually do uh, issues at this point of time but if you have to answer your question uh, i think uh, i feel that uh, investors will look for diversification 90% of asian investors are kind of invested in china and china related bonds they will look for diversification and india offers a good choice for that diversification that right. you dk yeah yeah so uh, coming back to you dr subara uh, i think you had alluded to it earlier i think and bethan also mentioned that uh, that rising interest rate should be a good thing and i think if all countries are raising simultaneously i think it it would definitely be uh, i think uh, synchronized in some sense um, so i mean is uh, we always see that uh, that that the when the countries think the the monetary policies across the world are are synchronized Uh, but they don't recover together i mean there are different uh, 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 issues with different economies and uh, so is there i think you've spoken about it and i think this uh, issue you also raised early on is that is there any way to coordinate exit policies i mean uh, uh, to minimize the spillover effects of a shift in policy i mean uh, is this a realistic assumption i mean to make i mean for a emerging market that this can ever be achieved from uh, my experience which dates back about 10 years ago i don't think that's a realistic possibility and the things have changed very much in the last 5 6 years which is very unlikely but let me go back to my own experience and relate that so that you can um, you can get a sense of what is possible you know uh, when i was governor in 2013 this currency wars used to be a constant issue of friction between advanced economies and emerging economies on the standard argument of emerging economies is to be this that look you gave us the washington consensus told us to integrate into the world we did that both rich countries and poor countries benefited as a consequence of that now this is payback time uh because of your extraordinary easing capital has flowed in and capital is flowing out and we are uh, vulnerable to this uh, sudden stops and reverses of capital flows it is unfair to leave the burden of adjustment to us you must share the cost that used to be the standard argument of emerging economies to that the response of advanced economies was not as sensitive as they were as i would have expected they did not dismiss the spillover impact they acknowledged that there is spillover from advanced economies to emerging economies but their argument was that this i have some sympathy for this argument which is that their mandate is domestic and they cannot take into account external factors into what is essentially a domestic mandate and second that recovery of the advanced economies in particular recovery of america as an international public good is an international public good so if america recovers it is good for everyone else so we should look at the positive side of it rather than complaining about it and third for some good measure whenever they were irritated they also used to say that instead of complaining in international forums like that we should set our own houses in order so it always used to be a dialogue of the deaf i don't believe things have changed very much uh, and i don't think circumstances have changed very much so any coordination will be very difficult of course coordination by getting in is difficult like you've said because you do it in a hurry you do it uh, in order to manage the crisis but coordination by getting out is equally difficult uh, but i must say to the uh, you know to the credit of advanced economy central banks that these days on private channels they do brief governors of emerging markets on what's happening and they're thinking so that uh, they're not completely suppressed 
Right, sir. And uh, I think coming back to you, Bethan, I think so this uh, ultra low interest rate regime that we have been seeing or the environment rather, it, there is, I think people also say that it could lead to mispricing of risks and also I think create zombie companies, so to say. I mean, is any of that uh, uh, visible or I mean a possibility? <laughs> Uh, the uh, so so the low interest rates um, that we're well I guess it's worldwide uh, we're experiencing in the United States but worldwide um, and I kind of I think like Sylvan had mentioned uh, it's hard to see interest rates going back to what was historically the the average for the United States for the federal funds rate at a five percent it seems like that's you know ways if if at all uh, but ways ways away um, so the question of zombie companies. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's that would be a concern. That's something to keep an eye on. But what we found was that um, with the with the pandemic induced a recession, um, there was support from the, the U.S. government. One would be considered, I guess, it was the pay, pay, uh, Paycheck Protection Program uh, that was put into place. But it really didn't get to the many of the businesses that were in need. Um, we did see a significant amount of uh, business failures across uh, across the U.S. So I um, so I. You know the question of of um, the question that you raised of zombie companies in the United States. That seems to be again. It doesn't seem to be a, a factor, a, a significant factor at this point in time. Right, right, right. Uh, uh, and uh, Sylvan, any of this playing out in Europe? Well, on, on zombie companies, so yes, the, the, the BIS has been flagging this risk um, some some years ago. And low interest, the context of low interest rates is, is one trigger of that, but um, maybe low productivity also. And um, re remember, so zombie companies are part of the supply chain. So they have an important role to play in the economy. They are provider of jobs. And at the same time, what we see in Europe is that uh, this pandemic has triggered a huge wave of business starts, especially in the sectors that have been hit by uh, by the lockdowns the most, so in the service sector. And maybe uh, maybe some 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 people uh, at the NBR are saying are observing the same development for the U.S. economy. So maybe the interest rates uh, are low, but. Uh, what is the real issue for for the low innovation of uh, of major economy uh, the, the major economy we have in Europe? So it's very very difficult question. And as I said, business starts are on the rise. Um, low interest rates basically should trigger more investment at some point. So um, it's not the the only factor, I would say. Right, right. Uh, and I have a brief comment on zombie companies. Uh, uh, in fact, one of the arguments against quantitative easing is that a crisis is an occasion for creative destruction. Uh, weak companies, zombie companies must be allowed to die. On the other hand, if you give them oxygen by way of quantitative easing and other measures, you're actually keeping them alive and you're not allowing the natural process of creative destruction take place. So I think a question of zombie companies surviving will actually be realized only with the benefit of hindsight. We will know three, four years from now if indeed zombie companies, which should have died, have in fact survived because of the oxygen given during the crisis. Uh, right, sir. And uh, Mr. Prasanna, uh, I think your last question to you, uh, and this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, in everybody's mind, what is the path for 10-year bonds in India? I mean, they have already firmed up and how do you see them play out uh, at least over the next six to 12 months? So uh, thanks, uh, DK, for the question. And before answering that question, let me just refer to uh, one comment uh, uh, Dr. Subarao made in one of his earlier uh, replies. And uh, he had spoken about if there is an outflow, uh, what, what should uh, the RBI be doing? And I think he made a fantastic point uh, to say that the forex reserves are high and this time around uh, monetary policy might not be the best tool uh, to uh, you know address the uh, outflows uh, from the currency uh, side i think uh, i completely endorse that view and i'm uh, i wanted to uh, you know kind of uh, say that so that he also uh, listens to it i think uh, part of the problem in the last one year has also been that India has actually had low rates from a historical perspective, but from a relative perspective, our real rates was quite uh, 
uh, i should say negative or lower but much on a relative basis the difference was still on the higher side because the other economies were going at a much lesser uh, real rates so what is happening is a lot of carry flows were actually coming into the economy and that is why the uh, the rbi had the possible uh, the impossible trinity as a problem and so if you really hike interest rates at this point of time it possibly exacerbates the same problem and you will probably get more flows i just wanted to make that point on the 10 year uh, dk um basically uh, like i said in my earlier reply uh, i think we have a lot of things going on in the economy uh, we have uh, a negative factors such as the uh, the global bond deals going up the monetary policy tightening across the globe uh, you have uh, the energy crisis which we have actually not spoken about at all today uh, so uh, the confidence level uh with investors about today's inflation coming down is actually not really there uh, because they actually see into the future that possibly some of these energy inflation is going to creep into the uh, actual inflation uh, so uh, that's another negative and the positives i can see is that the fiscal borrowing like you mentioned is a positive and a potential bond index inclusion could be another positive uh, so uh, there are a lot of tug of wars going on between these various uh, things and like i mentioned since one demand fulcrum which is the reserve bank of india buying so far is being taken away uh, it's uh, anybody's guess as who is going to do so my guess is that uh, six quarter to six half uh, or a range on the 10 year is what i would possibly want to you know uh, look at it because i'm reasonably convinced that the reserve bank of india will not want 10 year bond yields to go above six and a half when a situation when a repo rate is at 4% operating rate today is 335 but possibly we will go to 375 in december or february the curve is already very steep uh, so if you have to calculate real rates from the 10 year point i think it's substantial uh, so from that perspective i don't think they would want rates to go up so i would uh, place my bet on a range of 6 quarter to 6 half on the 10 right uh, so so that brings us to the conclusion of this panel discussion i'll just very quickly summarize i can't even attempt to summarize actually so overall i think the 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 the, the key messages i took were that the global prospects uh, have improved i think and uh, that uh, but there are still risks and uncertainty ahead uh, the systemically important central banks like the ecb and the fed they are fine tuning their communication their policies to engineer a very very smooth glide path uh, from a super easy policy but the possibility of surprises is very much there and uh, i think the 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 uh, the discussion on uh, on on the specter of fiscal dominance over monetary policy also i think it 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 i think as it was it was quite illuminating to know that i think it won't happen directly but i think through the back door there is possibility of it influencing and finally i think india is in a much better position than it was in 2013 to face these but i think face these uh, shocks but it's not immune to policy surprises i think that as dr subara very rightly pointed out uh, particularly since it has attracted huge capital flows so i think we should in a way be prepared for volatility uh, going ahead which i think part of it is already uh, playing out in a small way uh, with that i think uh, i would like to personally thank all the panelists i think for for making time for this and for this fabulous uh, discussion and now let me hand it over to pankhudi for vote of thanks thank you dk and thank you to all our esteemed speakers for their valuable time and inputs with this we bring today's proceedings to a close i would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us here and being such a wonderful audience stay safe stay well goodbye